This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, so my name is Crystal Carter. Um, I am uh, the daughter of a, a black American sailor um, called Cordell. Um, and um, I live in Exeter. Um, and I was involved with um, a project called um, Telling Our Stories, Finding Our Roots, um, which there's a leaflet um, in the back about from the beginning. Um, uh, yes, they've got leaflets over there. Um, and it was uh, a, um, a project letting people explore local history in Exeter, um, Exeter's multicultural history, and I focused on um, black Americans uh, who came to Exeter. Um, and I'm going to present with Louisa. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Louisa. Um, I'm a writer and I write poetry, I write fiction, um, I also write black history and I've done several projects researching the history and the presence of black and minority ethnic people in Dorset where I live now. Um, my father's Ghanaian, my mother's English, uh, we moved to Devon when I was 13, so over 30 years ago. I've lived in various parts of Devon and Dorset since then um, and I'm very passionate about the history in both, in both the counties. So our presentation um, is talking about the African American GIs in Devon and Dorset. Um, during World War II, the face of the southwest of England was changed by the arrival of the American troops, and that included thousands of African Americans. So our paper, which is focusing on Devon and Dorset, aims to provide a summary of the scale of the presence of the African American GIs, the type of work they carried out, whereabouts they were based, looking at the experiences of the soldiers in both the counties with a focus on Exeter and the Weymouth area in Dorset. We'll also be looking at segregation within the US Army and how the colour bar functioned here in the West Country um, but also sort of nationally and, and um, in America. We'll be looking at the interaction between the African Americans and, and the local people and the legacy of the soldiers which includes a cultural exchange and their descendants. Finally we'll be thinking about why is this history significant and relevant today. Um, so these are, this is a small collection of some of the imagery that's available of the uh, American soldiers when they were here during World War II. Uh, the one on the top left is actually Bristol. I um, can't remember the street, but um, it's a fantastic photo. Um, uh, the one on the top right is in Dorset. Um, this is also in Dorset. I've got more on Exeter, but uh, the, one, the one at the bottom is, is one of the um, national photos um, taken from a, a book on uh, the Negro Soldier by Ulysses Lee. Um, there are lots and lots of, ima lots and lots of images available of um, black Americans in England during World War II, but not all of them say specifically where they were. They just say somewhere in England, particularly because there was a security issue. Um, but they were, they were here in large numbers. Um, in Dor Devon and Dorset, there were uh, approximately 180,000 Americans um, in the two counties. Um, and you can see that they were all along the bottom of the coast. Um, and um, there, were, there were some also in a, bit, a bit in North Devon. Um, within the, the U.S. Army, nationally there were about a million um, U.S. soldiers who came during World War II, and about 10% <coughs> of them were, um, were African American. Um, so in Devon, that's you know, approximately, um, approximately 10,000, and in uh, Dorset, it's approximately 8,000. So this is a picture of some jeeps um, arriving in Exeter, and this quote um, from a local his history book which is written by Maureen Atwell and Denise Harrison, jeeps soon became more familiar on local highways than British cars. White dust covered the hedgerows as convoys ground up road surfaces en route to the woods. I thought this was quite a useful quote to sort of summarise how the locals may have seen physical changes in the landscape. So the cr increased traffic on the roads and the country lanes, the white dust which was churned up, the thousands of, of thousands of new faces living here, and the fact that the southwest was effectively turned into a giant army camp. Now, one of the reasons why we know how many uh, black soldiers there were um, in in the U.S. Army uh, is because the, the um, U.S. Armed Forces uh, had a standard policy of racial seg segregation amongst their ranks. Um, one soldier described it as when you arrived on, at the camp, you get off the bus, and they say white soldiers to the left and black soldiers to the right. Um, this was a, a continuation of Jim Crow that was seen in the South, um, and when they arrived in the UK, they, uh, they brought it with them. Um, so they essentially brought two armies. 
Um, uh, and this uh, extended not only to their operations, but also to leisure time. Um, uh, so the UK government, um, there, was, there was lots of debate in Parliament and, and things about how, how this was all going to function in, in the UK. Um, but they decided that they would implement the Visiting Forces, Forces Act, which would allow the US Army to have full control over their own operations and how they treated their soldiers, including um, uh, legal matters. So they had their own courts, they had their own, their own prisons. There was one in Shepton Mallet, not far from here, um, where they actually carried out um, uh, capital punishment um, because, uh, yeah, that was also legal <laughs> amongst um, the Americans. Um, so yes, this allowed, allowed them to bring in the color bar um, uh, in, in England, which wasn't specifically functioning. Um, now, amongst, the, um, amongst their operations, uh, they, there was promise of, of um, black Americans being uh, pushed into you know, officer training and things like that. But in actuality, um, approximately 78% of all black males in the, um, the US Armed Forces were doing things, uh, were doing service branch uh, activities. So things like um, quartermasters, which could be anything from laundry um, to um, you know, loading things up, loading things off, um, things like that. Engineers, engineers includes building highways. There was one troop who was sent uh, up to Austria, or no, to, up to Alaska to build, to build a very lar large role, uh, road in Alaska. Um, and you can see the, the spread of it, that a lot of it was, um, you know, Unglamorous things like transportation engineers, quartermaster, etc. And the troops who were based in Devon and Dorset were not immune to this. So this is the um, the 736 Medical Sanitary Sanitary Company, which sounds fun. Um, <laughs> their work in included um, digging ditches, uh, creating urine troughs, um, and building delousing units uh, for for the um, wider troops. Um, You'll notice that there are there are 60 African American uh, enlisted personnel here. There are three officers. All of the officers are white, um, so that was that was very common. Where you'd have you know the ranks would be would be um, black and the um, the officers would be white. Um, this is a the only photo we have of Exeter's GIs. This is not them in action, but them at the local um, Salvation Army. Um, we believe they're watching a film. Um, and they don't, they don't look particularly amused by it. Um, they had um, they they had the fantastic task of they had a laundry service, and they also were a truck regiment, um, and they also had a hospital detachment of patients, and that was because segregation in the army extended um, all the way to to um, hospitals and things. So there was a hospital that was on one side of the river that serviced um, the white soldiers, and there was a hospital detachment of patients that serviced the black soldiers. The other um, large, uh, the other main task that they had was to uh, manage the food depot um, for the whole of the US operation in Exeter. So this is an image from Dorset. This is down on Weymouth Quay. Um, we saw this uh, image earlier on in the presentation, and it's one of several photos that are actually kept at the Weymouth Reference Library. There's, um, sort of, I think it's three or four lovely black and white images which are kept there. Um, Weymouth and Portland had a key role to play in the Second World War, as a major part of the US assault force was launched from the Weymouth and Portland harbours, and it's thought that 517,816 troops and 144,093 vehicles left from Weymouth and Portland between the 6th of June 1944 and the 7th of May 1945. There's a plaque on Portland which states these figures. So um, this, is a, this is one of the more national photos, um, but it sort of uh, br brings to uh, bear the, um, you know, how, how blatant the, uh, the segregation in the, ar in the army was, so that the military and police colored. Um, the US Army had a, a policy called off limits, um, and that was how they uh, dealt with the issue that in England, there wasn't a specific um, color bar set up. Um, so, in places in America, there were you know clear designations for for black people and white people, but in, in England there wasn't. So they, um, in various different towns, had different ways of managing this. In um, in Exeter, Exeter is a city divided by a river, so the black soldiers were on one side of the river, and the um, the white soldiers were on the city center side of the river, which is where the Red Cross was, which is where the cathedral is, which is you know where all of the sort of things that that the tourists come to visit. Um, are at. 
Um, and the military police, there were military police placed, placed on either side of the bridge that separated the river, uh, that separated the two sides, um, to make sure that no one crossed. And if anyone did cross, then the military police would go around and they'd sort of round them up and send them back to where, the, where they went. Um, this did not go unnoticed by locals. Um, <laughs> Uh, so colored Americans um, came and there were near riots between the blacks and whites. The colored Americans stayed on the St. Thomas side of, of the X and there was no movement between the two groups. I remember that X bridge was closed off on both sides by military police and each group shouting dreadful insults across the river at each other. I'm sure that if they were allowed to uh, get across there would have been murder. Um, and that's probably not an exaggeration. Um, uh, Exeter, as far as I can tell, was fairly uh, benign with regards to um, some of the activity between the, between the local soldiers. But um, Louisa can tell you that there, there in other places there were um, more activities. So this image is um, thought to have been taken in Hertfordshire and shows black soldiers um, sort of relaxing outside of the country pub. So in Dorset, how did the colour bar function here? Well, it meant there were separate pubs, it meant there were separate dances held on different nights. Um, there were either separate churches or the soldiers would be separated within, within a church. Young men were allowed to drink alcohol. The American young men were allowed to drink alcohol, possibly some of them for the first time in the UK, and it's possible that this may have fuelled the already existing racial tension between the black and white soldiers. In any, in any case, a mix of alcohol, young men, and racism would not have been a good one. So many fights took place in Dorset, and anecdotal and other evidence suggests that several black soldiers were actually murdered in Dorset by their white colleagues. So that a local resident, Eric Westmacott, described puddles of blood on Lodmore Hill. An author, Nigel Clark, researched um, a, a murder that took place in, by, of a black GI by a white one outside the Marine Theatre in Lyme Regis after a fight broke out over a lighter. Anecdotal and other evidence also suggest that several lynchings and castrations took place in Weymouth with the crime of black men socialising with white women. This is a quote from a Weymouth journalist. Uh, she was staying at some isolated cottages after a US army camp. When returning home, she heard the most dreadful screaming. We found next day a black soldier had been castrated by his white comrades for dancing with a white girl all evening. A few days later, the same journalist was climbing down from the pier uh, for a swim and found she was treading on a dead black man with a knife in his back. Apparently, he was guilty of a similar crime. This is a lovely image. Um, and this is quite interesting, really, because my interpretation of this image was that it was black GIs playing with their white colleagues, playing football with their white colleagues um, on an afternoon in uh, Dorchester. But as my Devon colleagues pointed out, there's different ways of interpreting uh, the, the sort of evidence we're, we're presented with. So I sort of imagined, perhaps naively, that they'd put segregation aside and they were all having a lovely afternoon. Um, but it may, it may not have been that. The white men could have been British um, soldiers, they could have been local Dorset men. We may never know. Images like this can open up a dialogue around history and how we interpret the information we're presented with. The quote at the bottom, I really like this quote, um, from a West Country farmer. I love the Americans, but I don't like those white ones they've brought with them. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant, and it possibly sums up how local people felt about the white Americans. So what was the local response? We've got a few quotes here. There's a couple from um, Exeter, well, Devon and Exeter, and a couple from Dorset. I'll just read a couple of them for you, because they're quite long. The first one, contrary to popular belief, there were coloured Americans in Exeter. A dance held at Emmanuel Hall with a band from Torquay produced a tremendous display of jitterbugging by one particular coloured soldier. An amazing athletic performance. And that was from Maurice of Exeter, Devon. Um, this, this quote at the bottom by Richard Brooks. He was one of the people I interviewed. I should have mentioned that the research from this, uh, for this presentation comes from a, a book I, I wrote a few years ago called 1944, We Were Here, African American GIs in Dorset. And many of the people I interviewed were sort of elderly people who remembered seeing the soldiers, and the memories stayed with them for, for all the rest of their lives. They've made such an impression. So this quote um, by Richard Brooks. So off we went to see these guys, and sure, they were, they were all as dark as can be. I was seven. I never knew anything about segregation. To youngsters, it didn't matter. They were very good to us. We had sweets. I used to take home butters, jam, and fruit from these guys. When a camp of dark-skinned men arrived in the village on the Dorset coast, I suppose that it was strange. 
Even today, there's not many coloured people living here. At that time, dark people were a rare appearance. I didn't know until later that their life back home wasn't very good. If they wanted to sit next to me, they could sit next to me. We treated them as ordinary human beings. So this is a lovely image, and this image is thought to have been taken um, of some GIs relaxing in Poundbury, which is near Dorchester. And I love this image because they, in this moment, they just, they just look so happy, and I think it's a really lovely image, although we don't know what went on, what they went on to, to do after this. So um, the sentiments that, that um, are quoted, that, that, that Louisa just quoted, um, are uh, very similar to what, um, what has been found uh, to be the experience of the black GIs themselves, um, that they felt that they were treated as human beings here, here in, um, in England. Um, in, during, during the war, um, the NAACP, um, uh, uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People um, based in America, sent over Walter White um, to do a survey of uh, black soldiers um, in England. Um, and uh, this was because um, they were working as part of a, what they called the double V, um, which was to end segregation uh, in, the, in the armed forces and to end segregation at home. I mean, during, during the, war, the war, there was also, um, there were lynchings and things still going on, and there was segregation still going on in America. So it was quite an important, important time. Um, so we don't have any direct quotes from, um, from soldiers based in Exeter, um, <coughs> but um, regarding, regarding the, their relationships with local people, um, they found that, uh, that almost without exception, the brightest note in the stories of all Negro soldiers I talked with, this is from Walter White, um, uh, were the f stories of the friendships that had formed with British people. At uh, first alarmed by tales of Negroes, the British common man had reacted in favor um, of those who he believed had m been maligned and against those who had told stories about Negroes, which the British had found to be fantastic and untrue. For many Negroes, it was the first experience of being treated as normal human beings and friends by white people. With response to their, um, their uh, relationships with white soldiers, um, in, in, um, whilst in the European theater of war, um, people, there were people who were having constant fights with, with white soldiers and they're saying, what are we over here fighting for? We were sent to the European theater of war to fight the Nazis uh, or our white soldiers. Um, and Walter White had no response to that. And the second, the second quote there is from a, a man who had a, a mathematics degree from the University of Michigan um, and was sent to England to dig ditches. Um, which he thought, which smarted a bit, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, so he wasn't particularly happy about that. Um, so thinking about the legacy of the African Americans, one of the most, arguably most important parts of their legacy was the children that they fathered here. Um, the African Americans were very popular with local women and they mixed with them in spite of the white Americans not wanting this to happen. Um, so the, the, the number of children were born so these were known in the time, at the time um, as brown babies. Some of the women who had the black jive children were already married, but as it was wartime, attitudes were understandably different. People didn't know if their husbands would return home. They didn't even know if they'd make it to the next morning alive. Um, it's estimated that 83 children of black GIs were born at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital in Exeter. And my Dorset research identified that there were 13 uh, children of black GIs, but official records state that there were 17 children born in Dorset. It's, um, it's likely that the Dorset figure was actually a bit higher than that, uh, possibly, but that's, that's all we have. It's thought that there are 39 children of black GIs born in Somerset and 38 in Cornwall. These, um, there was a stigma of unmarried mothers at the time, um, and this was made worse by, by the fact they had mixed heritage children. You couldn't quite so easily explain them away if your husband had been away fighting. Mm. Um, and the children had quite a varied experience, as, as, far as, I, as far as I understand. Some were rejected by their parents and step-parents, um, others were accepted. Evidence suggests that the children weren't forcibly taken away and put into care as they were in other parts of the UK. Um, but it remains a taboo subject. So the families and also some of the GI children themselves still won't talk about what happened to this day all these years later. So these, these people have had um, the unique experience of being mixed heritage in 20th century West Country. And these are images of some of the children. So on the left we have um, Paul Nash, uh, and he was the only one who met his father. His father is the one in the sailor outfit um, 
sporting a cigarette. So he, went, he actually found his father and went to meet him in New York, where he was living at the time. Sadly, Paul has now died. Uh, in the middle, we have John Stockley. I'm just going to read an extract of his story next. On the right is Carol Travers, and she lives in Poole, and she's been desperately searching for her father for many years with no, no success so far. So I'm just going to read an extract of um, John Stockley's story. Leslie John Stockley was born in Weymouth on May the 7th, 1945, effectively the last day of the war. He was born at Weymouth College as the maternity hospital had been bombed. My mother was already married to Leslie, his stepfather. All I know about my father is what people outside of my own family have told me. I believe he was quite tall. I'm tall, six foot three. Apparently he was a very smart and striking man and he stood out. John's family had refused to tell him anything about his father or the circumstances which led to his birth. He was brought up by his grandmother at Moonfleet. There were other uh, black uh, GI's children at school, um, however they didn't openly talk about their situation. John says they knew who they were and what had happened, they just didn't dwell on it. It was just something that was there. In total, John says there were seven boys in Weymouth who were the offspring of African-American GIs. John, Ritchie, Raymond, Bob, Paul Nash, as we saw earlier, Graham and Gerald, all of whom were friends. Sadly, most of them have now died. John says none of, the, none of their families, apart from Paul Nash's family, would actually talk about what happened or their heritage. One of the boys was told by his sister that their mother went to a dance and was drugged and raped by a black soldier. John remembers trying to change himself and become white by drinking milk of magnesia and eating chalk. At school, children could be very nice or very nasty, and there was racial abuse at times. He has one particularly vivid memory. I was playing football in the schoolyard. I collided with another guy. I was about eight, and he got up and called me a dirty N-word. This was a guy that lived 150 metres from me, so my reaction was to punch him on the nose. I remember the blood on the snow. I was marched to the headmaster's office. My mother was summoned to the school, and I remember standing next to her in front of him, and him saying to her, you have to remember, Mrs. Stockley, you cannot educate these people. So the legacy um, also extends to um, cultural change. Oh, this be me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this is why. Sorry, just ignore that. Um, okay, so yeah, the, the legacy also included a cultural exchange between the African Americans. Uh, and the Americans in general as well, and the local people. So the presence of the black servicemen um, meant that a cultural exchange took place, and this included dances, so there were new dances brought to Devon and Dorset. This included the jive and the jitterbug, which might have replaced things like the waltz and the foxtrot. There was new music brought to Dorset. There's blues music, blues piano was heard in the local country pubs, and Negro spirituals were heard in churches. Um, the spiritual music was very popular, and an example of this is shown by the fact that over a thousand people attended a concert in, at a church in Dorchester. So the face of Devon and Dorset um, was changed with a large black, black population, and locals learned about people different to themselves and about the experiences they faced at home. They learned about racism and how it impacts on people. There's a quote here from what is believed to be a, a, a schoolgirl from Dorchester. We must have made a strange picture a group of darky soldiers around a fire, a dozen children, mums and friends, babies in pushchairs. Voices from the deep south against the children's voices from Dorset. We pointed the way to the sea, little knowing soon there would be sailing to the Normandy beaches. So the, the US Army in general also brought sort of slang and new sayings which sprung up, such as got any gum chum, and they brought food and luxury items which would have no doubt been very welcomed in times of rationing. So this, um, this impact still continues today. Um, if you, the top left is a book called The Amazing Story of Adolphus Tips um, by Michael Morapungo, which is about a little girl who loses his cat because Michael Morapungo loves stories about people losing pets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, on, the, on the left there we have um, Nehi Theatre did an adaptation of, of that, um, that uh, book um, into a, a play called The 946, um, which features um, which features black soldiers um, uh, in, in Devon, um, uh, particularly around the sort of Slapton Sands area. Um, down on the right, we have the, um, the television um, series of um, Small Island, um, and the um, I'm sure anyone who's read that book will remember the interaction between the um, white American soldiers and the, and the Commonwealth soldiers in, um, in, 
England, and then there's Small Island in the book as well, um, which I think was distributed nationally um, as part of a program. And then on the, uh, on the, on the bottom corner, we have James Earl Jones, uh, who in 2013 did, a, did a, a version of Much Ado About Nothing, uh, where he plays a black, black GI. Um, it got horrible reviews, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's another example of, of this story enduring um, amongst um, Britain. So the relevance today, um, again, it's, it's very important in the, in, you know, the wider cultural, cultural um, uh, impact. And also, um, there, it's important because there are still black descendants, or there's still, still descendants of these GIs around, around the area. Um, uh, and um, the memories are, are fading, um, so it's good to, good to get them out. Um, and also, I think it's important because it shows um, a, an ongoing connection between, between um, black communities um, from, around, from around the world um, and how it uh, has, how the areas that we think of as being, I don't know, fairly, fairly white um, are actually maybe not as white as we, as we think. Um, then the, what happens next? So in 1945, the war ends and approximately 1,000 children of black GIs become part of Britain. Um, 1948, um, Harry Truman ends the segregation of the US military. In 1955, the civil rights movement begins in earnest and, um, and civil rights uh, you know, ends, brings, the segregation to, to, or it brings an end to segregation in America. Um, in 1964, they finally do uh, end segregation in the United States. And on the that the political cartoon there is um, is depicting an incident between uh, Leary Constantine, the cricketer, um, who while, during the war was turned away from a, a hotel in London um, because there were white GIs there. Um, and uh, as a result, um, he filed suit. Um, it was dis it was discussed in Parliament, and and his interaction and, and you know the fallout from all of that um, formed the basis for the first anti discrimination laws in the UK. Um, so there is a direct link between between the two things. Um, furthermore, the um, the uh, League of Coloured Peoples um, holds, hold, is who held the conference about the about the GI's children um, after the war. Um, and there are other other organizations in the in the UK who um, helped out with with some of these children because black GIs weren't allowed to take them weren't, weren't allowed to take their children home, um, even if they wanted to. Um, these are further references. Um, uh, Louisa has a book. Um, my my research is available um, on the Telling Our Stories, Finding Our Roots uh, website. Um, and there's information about GIs around around the UK um, and lots of good references there. And thank you. Thank you.